Hello, survivors, and welcome to the State of Decay 2 stream. I'm your host, Jeffrey Card, and this is going to be a very special stream today because we're going to be making content with you live on the air. This is something that I actually did for a Discord event uh, that we held around the anniversary of State of Decay's 1 and 2 uh, that we did a little bit earlier this summer, but I figured I'd try to bring it to a broader audience because we had a lot of fun last time, and I think with a little bit more preparation, uh, I can do a better job this time. Uh, but before we get into the details, let's introduce my co-host, Brant Fitzgerald. Hello, Brant. It's good to see you. Hello. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Jeffrey. <laughs> So Brant is going to be the one who's paying attention to the chat because between my notes of all of the user suggestions that we collected before the stream began and the editor and everything I'm going to be managing, there's no way I'm going to be reading your comments. So Brant is going to be paying attention to your comments and now and then, and then he's going to rudely interrupt me and tell me what you're talking about. So thank you, Brant, for taking that job for me. Yeah, and, and before anybody gets into it, if I don't get to your comment, it was either a terrible comment or I just didn't read it. It's all, it's all a personal judgment on you and probably is going to be read out to you by St. Peter when you get to the pearly gates. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> This is going to affect your, your, your eternal, eternal reward. So, okay, let me introduce a little bit of, of what we're doing here. So State of Decay 2 uh, is made up of a lot of different parts, and most of those parts require a lot of collaboration between different parts of the team. Uh, there's artists, there's animators, there's programmers, there's sound designers, there's writers, and there's game designers like me. And I probably left out several other people, including QA. QA is very important. We're going to talk about them in just a minute. Um, but... So most of these parts of the game, if a game designer wants to change something, usually what we'll do is we'll collaborate with other members of the team, and other members of the team will be doing a lot of the heavy lifting, making stuff work, because game designers don't have any skills as a general rule. But there are certain parts of, and actually, I'm, that's not fair to other game designers. Most of them have more skills than I do. But a game designer like me, who mostly knows how to design games and write, uh, there's a lot of things that I can't do. But I usually try to set it up so that there's a few parts of the game where I can actually edit things and create things in completely by myself without needing to ask for anyone else's help. Uh, and that's actually a really good way to handle things because if you think about it, you know, programmers are a very precious resource. And uh, if you're going to use a programmer's time, you should use it really, really sparingly and well so that they can take the massive skills that they've developed over the course of a long education and a lot of experience with, you know, computer science and programming. We should devote that towards the places where it can be most used. And having a programmer have to, you know, take time out of their schedule to implement every single trait in a game with with 1,350 traits, that's not a good use of their time. So instead what we do is we have a programmer, uh, like, like Jürgen in this case, uh, he set up this tool for me uh, so that I could make traits and skills and a bunch of other stuff on my own. All he did was give me a tool and then I could just run with it. And so what I figured we would do on this stream is I would take a couple of those parts of the game where I can just kind of make whatever I want and we could go through it together, see how the tool works, see how the data comes together, and then using some of the suggestions that we gathered from the audience before the stream began, I could actually implement some new traits, some new names, some new skills right here on the air with you. So I think this is going to be fun. Uh, the one thing I should mention, though, going, getting back to QA, I am going to have to write up a task, basically, in JIRA, in our like task tracking software, that lists everything that I did so that QA can check it. So there is never really anything in a game that uh, you make entirely by yourself, because no matter what, it has to pass through the hands of the people who ensure it works before it goes out to the audience. So I, I do kind of enjoy these parts of the game because there's a lot of it I can do by myself, but really everything in the game is collaborative to some degree or another. And massive thanks to QA for all the times I've just sent them random traits that I've just decided to make one day, uh, and they put the time into testing it out just on a whim of mine. I really appreciate all of that extra effort. This is, this is one of those Jurassic Park failure moments where we didn't pass the Jurassic Park test of whether or not... We kept asking ourselves whether we could and whether... <laughs> didn't ask ourselves whether we should give Jeffrey free, unfettered, you know, access to the trait menu. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we'll we'll see how many regrets people have after this stream. <laughs> All right, so this is what we call the Undead Labs Data Editor. This is actually not part of the Unreal Editor. This is an extra tool that we built outside of Unreal uh, to help us manage the sheer amount and complexity of data that we were building around things like traits. Also, all of the guns, uh, their data is edited in here. Basically, anything where we needed to create a huge number of pieces of content and balance them all against each other in one place, in a very searchable, in a very sort of uh, validated format. And we could talk about what a, what a lot 
of that means uh, later on down the line. But basically, we felt like you know it, some of the needs of these particular systems could be better served by a custom tool that we used rather than using uh, what comes natively in the Unreal Editor. So that's what you're looking at here. Um, everything in the Undead Labs data editor has got sort of this tree structure to it. Even our mission designs, which are also done in here. Uh, our mission scripting is done with this kind of tree structure where everything has sort of got an order to it. And you can basically, you know, you build something on a high level and then you can give it children uh, that, that inherit things. Um, and so let me just sort of show you what the structure of this looks like. And by the way, I usually have this stretched out much bi much bigger across a 1440p screen. Uh, I've shrunk it down to a quarter of that, hoping that those of you who watch this show on a phone will be able to follow what's going on. Uh, so I hope that you can. I don't think I could have made it usable and made it much smaller than this. We don't do this kind of job on a phone. We do this on the largest screen we can slap our faces against. But this right here is basically, this is a list of all the different categories of traits that are in the game. Most of the traits in the game fall under starter traits. These are the, the, the traits that basically can be assigned to any randomly generated character at their inception, like when they're created from a character schema. Um, and so you can see there's 1,316 of these. Uh, in, in addition to that, we've got a bunch of different types that I'm not actually going to explain all of them. Injuries is an interesting one. You might not have realized that all injuries are actually secretly traits under the hood. We don't list them with the traits on the character sheet. We list them, you know, near your health bar. Uh, but as you can see, they're sort of grouped here where, you know, these are the, tr these are the injuries that you get from blunt force trauma, you know, a sprained wrist, abrasions, cracked ribs, dislocated shoulder. And each of these has got different effects on you, different effects on your health bar, different effects on, you know, your character's capabilities when you have them. Uh, you know, from an explosion, you could get, you know, second degree burns, shrapnel, third degree burns, which are different levels of, of severity. Um, and, you know, from a fall, you could get a sprained ankle or a fractured disc, very different levels of severity. And so whenever we're sort of injuring you and we're sort of rolling randomly to determine whether you get injured and what kind of injury you get, that comes from this list of traits. So they're traits under the hood because basically a trait is a thing you can imply to a character and it sticks with them indefinitely and it carries with it a set of buffs for that character and sometimes for the community. And uh, because we had already made traits when it was time to make injuries, Injuries, we're, we're going to need to do all the same things as traits, so we just made them traits. And you'll see that a lot in, vi in, in game development. Like, you'll, if something already does a certain job and you want something else to do a similar job, you just co-opt the thing you already have rather than writing something entirely new. So if you go to... <laughs> <We've> <laughs> already, I think we've already got a winner. Oh, really? What's that? Yeah. Career. Game designer trait. Never checks with QA. Quote. <laughs> My ideas work. No need to double check. Sometimes waste materials. Mike Gallagher. Thank you, Mike Gallagher. Yes, that is an excellent suggestion for a trait. Unfortunately, I'm going to be implementing the ones that I already made notes on uh, that we gathered from social media prior to this stream. But that is an excellent idea, and I feel like people would probably appreciate it. If I, People on the team would probably appreciate it if they encountered that, if I stuck it in the game. Um, so yeah, so let me, uh, oh, so for instance here, this is the Daybreak list. This is a set of traits we added when we added Daybreak, and this is all the Red Talon traits. So these traits, they're not on the starter traits list, which means they can't be added to a regular character, only the characters who specifically are designed with a schema that insists on these, this, this category of traits will get those traits. And so that's why Red Talon characters have traits that no one else has. It's because they fall under this list. And I realized while I was going through this that actually I usually I've made a tradition of saying that uh, that I made 1,350 traits uh, in the game. But over time, we keep adding a, a new one here and there. And I think the number is actually closer to 1,400 now, uh, which is a little bit crazy. So let's open up the starter traits and see how this list is sort of categorized. So uh, we've got, let's see, let me just close some of these. I opened a bunch of these things up so that I could uh, look at them myself. That basically we've divided the traits up into broadly what they affect, whether they affect cardio or wits or the fighting skill or the shooting skill, whether they have community benefits, like broad community benefits, like they help with morale or they offer an income or something like that. Combo, which is just a catch-all place for traits that do multiple things and they don't really fit into any category. Quirk, yeah, these are the traits that unlock those quirk skills, those extra fifth skills that don't fall into any of the normal categories, some of which we'll be making today. Uh, stats, which affect things like your health, your stamina, 
how fast you not how fast but how much your fuel efficiency with a car various things like that that are not skills uh minor is just traits that are there mostly for storytelling some of them have small effects but mostly they're just there to sort of flesh out the character and then philosophy this has to do with uh with basically whether you are a sheriff or a warlord things like that you know the kind of attitude that your character has so we've subdivided them into all of these categories here. Uh, and if we open up one of these, I'm trying to remember which one it was now. I think it might have been wits. Uh, yeah, I wanted to sort of look at one particular trait. Now, we've also subdivide, subdivided these so that, like, you know, the, uh, the traits that are just good, they just improve your wits, uh, go in this category. Traits that actually give you a wit specialization, so you out of the gate, that character starts with a specialized skill, that goes under the advanced section. And then hindered, these are people who have limited wits. Things like gullible, uh, things like easily distracted, things like forgetful. But we're not going to look at those right now. Let's look at one of our advanced wits traits to sort of go down the data and sort of talk about how a trait is put together before we start making some traits ourselves. So this right here, the name, this is the name that we use to reference this trait uh, when we're sort of calling it out somewhere else in, in, in the game. If, if we have something that wants to assign the wallflower trait to a character, this is how we reference it. And you don't see this when you're in the game. This is just the name we use internally. They all have to be unique. They all have to be these long strings without any spaces in them. And that's not how, you, how we want you to see the traits in the game. This right here is the display name, Wallflower. This is what you actually see on your character sheet when your character gets this trait. Uh, the weight, 100, uh, this is how we make traits more or less common than other traits. Uh, so if this one has 100, that's sort of the average value that we put on things. If we want to make a trait uncommon, like for instance, uh, burglar, we reduce the number. So that means that a burglar, uh, the burglar trait will come up a quarter of the frequency of the wallflower trait, which is at 100. If we wanted a trait to be very common, we'd give it a bigger number. We could make it 400 to make it four times as common as wallflower. And then you'll notice we've got the display name. And then if you look, if you look at your traits fly out and you see the descriptions of the traits, uh, you'll see something like this. I'm really, really good at not being noticed. Um, and so this is sort of explains like a little bit of sort of the backstory of the trait, like what it means to the character to have this trait. Uh, and what I'm implying here is this character is a wallflower. Like they're, they're the person who, you know, they're not out dancing in the middle of the floor at the dance. They're the person who's standing by the wall just watching what's going on. And we're implying that that means that that person is particularly good at stealth. Uh, and so right here, this is their hero bonus. Uh, this is referencing the specific hero bonus that this character could have because they have this trait. When we're picking a hero bonus for a character, we look at all of their traits. There's usually about three on a character. And we basically roll randomly amongst the hero bonuses that those traits suggest. So if a character has the wallflower trait, there's like a one in three chance they'll end up with the quiet time uh, hero bonus, which I can look up right now, actually, because the hero bonuses are in the same file. So if we go and look at noise quiet time, we can see that this is, you know, I've set up certain hours at night where we try to keep the noise down to give people a chance to really relax and think, and it reduces noise at the base by one. So it's a pretty minor hero bonus, uh, but that's, that's what that does. Uh, so a character who's a wallflower is likely to have that hero bonus. And then down here, we've got the tags. The tags are an interesting little system. These are how we try to manage which traits belong together on the same character. Because when you've got procedurally generated characters, one of the things that you, that you worry about is, I'm going to randomly generate a character that makes no sense, that contradicts itself, that feels false, that feels wrong. And if you're, if you're handcrafting a character, you can make a character who is full of contradictions, and that's an interesting character. But to make that work, you have to really put the writing time into explaining that character, justifying that character. <coughs> and uh, when you're randomly generating a bunch of characters, you don't have that opportunity to explain to a player and to justify to a player why this character is full of contradictions. So if you end up rolling up a character who seems to have apparent contradictions, it just feels like you failed. It just feels like you messed something up. It doesn't feel like you made an interesting character. And so we had to come up with a system that would let uh, characters not contradict themselves. So for instance, um, we've got this trait, this, these tag, this tag called attribute, which means that uh, this is, you know, a description of a person's personality and we only let each character have one. So if we give a character an attribute uh, uh, trait, that means that they can't have another one. So we don't end up with two of them contradicting each other. Um, we might actually let them have two attributes. I'm not sure, but, but there's also, uh, there's different categories. Like for instance, 
before story. That's a similar tag. We only let characters have one before story. And what a before story is, is it's some trait that tells you a story about bef their life before the outbreak. And because those could easily conflict with each other, we only let each character have one of those. Similarly, a story about what they did in the wake of the outbreak. Uh, that gets the after story. Uh, uh, tag, which means that we can't have two conflicting stories. One that says, this is how I survived, and another one says, actually, this is how I survived. That would feel wrong. It would feel fake and bad. And so we, uh, so we make sure that they're categorized that way. Similarly, if you, only, if you already have a trait that affects your standing, you can't have another trait that affects your standing. Uh, if you already have a trait that affects the wit skill, we don't give you another trait that affects the wit skill because in, me in mechanical ways, those could interfere with each other and make the character not make any sense balance-wise. Um, and then we have a few more things here like hero. We just put that on every trait that has a hero bonus so we can make sure that every character ends up with a hero bonus. Not badass is something we put on characters who, you know, they have traits that make them sound just a little bit pathetic. So if we want to have a character who is incredibly badass and that's like the main way they come across, we give them the badass tag. And if they have the opposite of that, we give them the not badass tag. Um, and then conflict peaceful, somebody who's a wallflower, when, when there's going to be a conflict in the base, they're not going to be involved typically. And so we put this tag on characters who have certain traits to say this character is not going to be the one starting fights or even being involved in fights. And Perfect. so that, yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt here. Oh, go for it. A very important uh, thing has been brought up in chat. The, um, the desperate need for a taco connoisseur, taco chef trait. And... Um, I will go so far as to say that anybody with that name should have the name Brant on it as well. Okay, we, we will have to keep that in mind. Maybe, maybe we'll have some time to sneak that in at the end. By the way, uh, something Viscid just, uh, just said that uh, the wallflower trait should have the line, I can make it home with one headlight, uh, which is out there for all you 90s kids like me. Thanks, uh, thanks Viscid. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of tags we can put on this. This is just a few of them. Um, but let's move on to the next section. So buffs, character buffs. These are things that like will basically change the stats of the character. So in this particular case, the wallflower trait uh, affects a character's standing rate. So standing is the thing that fills up your little bar that says citizen until it says hero. And that's when you start contributing your hero bonus to the community and, and when you're eligible to be made a leader. This character, because they're a wallflower, they gain those standing rewards at 50% the rate, which means it takes them twice as long to become a leader because they're shy. They're unassuming. They don't put themselves out there, which is fine. I mean, they, will, they can eventually become a leader. It just takes them a little bit longer to get comfortable. Nicknames. Here we can uh, we can give characters nicknames based on their traits, and we're going to get into this a little bit more later. But basically, we wanted uh, characters to have names that are not just based on their given names and their last names. We wanted characters to have some nicknames that are based on some story from their past or from some attribute that other people notice in them, and that they've given them a nickname based on that. So in this particular case, a character who is known as a wallflower might have an, a nickname that is. Uh, ev evocative of a flower, like Bud, uh, Violet, or Florian. Uh, and we've got these split up by gender. Uh, you, know, you can see it sort of lined up here, male, female, non-binary. Uh, and so because some names, because names in our culture are so heavily gendered, it feels weird for a character to get a name that feels like it's the wrong gender for that character. And so we make sure that we have the ability in sort of the way that we mark up this text, because there's a lot of places where I can just stick a, 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 a sort of a, a name that is that doesn't feel gendered at all. You can just slap the name in, in this slot. You don't need to put all this fancy stuff here. But if you've got a name that does sound gendered, you can split it up so that depending Depending on the gender of the character, they'll get a different version of the nickname, uh, you know, depending on who they are. Here we've got community buffs, which are not used very often by traits because traits tend to be about the individual. Community buffs are an entirely different category of buffs that affect the entire community at large. Things like uh, uh, incomes of resources uh, and, and noise at the base, stuff like that. Uh, here and there, we, we do have traits that affect that, but it's a little bit less common. Uh, and Wallflower doesn't affect it. Um, and then we've got skill operations and modifications. This is all of the stuff that makes a trait, say, affect skills uh, in its description. And basically, this is how we assign you brand new skills. Like in this case, we're giving you the stealth specialization. We're just basically blasting all the way through wits. I think this character already got their wits to the maximum, and they've selected the stealth, uh, the stealth specialization already. And then on top of that, we add two levels of stealth uh, on the character. So they basically start with two levels of stealth, plus or minus just a little bit of extra experience uh, that we sort of slap on at the end to, to dirty them up a little bit, make them look a little bit more lived in. 
So that is uh, sort of the makeup of a trait. That's how we put it together. So every time you make a trait, you basically go down this list and you sort of make all of these decisions about that trait. And that's what I was doing for a month or so of my life uh, in like 2016 or something, 2017 maybe. I was going through and doing this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times until we got this entire list. Um, but let's have a look at some of the suggestions that folks made uh, from the audience. Uh, so, so a lot of people made a ton of suggestions and they were all really interesting to read. Some of them would work as a trait uh, for me to add right now and some of them wouldn't. So let's actually start by talking through some of the you know, neat ideas that people suggested that actually wouldn't work right now uh, for various reasons. So first off, um, Altered Beast 420 uh, made a lot of suggestions for traits that would add entirely new mechanics to the game. Things like having a lone wolf mode that's attached to a trait on a particular character, or saying that a character is homeless, and that means that they can claim any site as a base rather than relying on an official home site. Or there was one called that he called Hands Solo, uh, which was uh, somebody who can fight without weapons, they can just fight with their fists. And all of those traits, they sound like neat ideas for, you know, for ways to vary characters or, or very situations, uh, very game modes, basically. But each of them is so large and all-encompassing, there's no way that I could actually add it as a trait. As you can see, you know, this is what a trait is. A trait is a list of choices, uh, like the ones that you see here. And none of these give me the power to add entire mechanics to the game. That would be a completely different process that I could not possibly go through on this stream. So, like, I think I take all of those under advisement as suggestions of, like, things that, that Altered Beast would love to see in the game, but I couldn't possibly add them as traits, not on my own. Uh, similarly, um, Redline is a suggestion by Furion, uh, who suggested that the, uh, this, this would be a character for whom the higher up the infection meter you go, uh, the more melee damage you do. So basically, the sicker you get, the more powerful you get, which encourages people to sort of ride the edge. And that's a great idea for a trait. Like That sounds like that could be really, really cool, except that that would require me to pull in a programmer to create that, uh, basically a brand new buff that varies those two things uh, it, it, like like uh, together. Basically, as this one stat goes up, another stat goes up. That's not a thing that I can just do in the traits editor. Now, if we had approached traits in a different way and had set them up so that each of them is basically individually programmed or even s individually scripted using something like Blueprint within Unreal, uh, something like that could easily be possible. If we had approached it that way, um, they could absolutely have given me the power to create relationships between two different stats like that. But we decided instead to go with a, a, an approach to this where making a trait was very simple and quick and easy so that I could make 1,350 of them. And I would not need to actually, with each one of them, go through all of the effort and the headaches involved in programming or scripting them to work a certain way. Instead, we treated traits like data. We don't do any logic inside of the trait. We only fill it out with data that is then read by logic that is prefabbed to work with every possible trait. So an idea like that is a really good one, but the way that we, you know, in order for us to have 1,350 of them, we had to kind of hamstring the system in a certain way to make it so that every trait was very simple. Um, Let's see here. So similarly, uh, I am Roofstone suggested we could do some relationship traits that said, I am the brother of so-and-so or I am the wife of so-and-so. Um, and that's actually an idea. We actually did uh, uh, mess with that idea a little bit. It ended up not going fully into the game because we couldn't take it. We did, just didn't have, we ran out of time. We didn't have time to, to, to make that work all the way. But we would have had to treat that as a special case set of traits. It would be its own category of traits that would be managed in a totally different way because making those connections between different characters and pulling the name of a different character into the name of a trait, that's something that I can't do with the current system as it stands. So it's a really good idea. It's so good. I also had the same idea five years ago, uh, six years ago. But, um, uh, and so that's the definition of a good idea is if I had it. Um, but <laughs> in any case, um, you know, but, but that's something we couldn't do right now with the tool as it stands. Um, so Vincent Gargilo suggested that we could have an OCD trait that involves a character always shutting the, shutting the door behind them. Uh, and so having characters shut the door behind them, that would be probably pretty cool. I think a lot of people kind of think it's funny that characters just leave doors open and then the doors close themselves on their own at some point in, 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 you know, in time. It doesn't feel quite as realistic, um, but, uh, so, but that's something I couldn't do as a trait. That's a character behavior. But also I wanted to highlight the fact that we did not, we deliberately did not actually include the diagnosable names of any um, like mental illnesses or conditions uh, in our traits because it's so easy to misrepresent those. Uh, like we, we, we 
toyed with the idea. In fact, if you look in some of the names of our traits, I forgot where these live. It might be under minor, it might be under stats, uh, but we actually do have uh, a trait that was called OCD under the surface. Um, I don't remember where it was. I'm going to find it. I'm going to use my little finder here. There it is. So we actually do have one who its name was OCD because we were toying with the idea of what would it be like to rep try to represent these sort of you know, psychological conditions and things like that in the game. But after talking to a lot of people, we basically ended up deciding that we didn't want to try to represent these things by name because it's so easy to feel like you're not really doing a good job of representing them. And people who have been diagnosed with these conditions would feel like this game is saying that it's representing me, but it's doing a garbage job because each of these traits they've got such limited power we, we can only do so much with them right um and so instead we sort of explained uh, we, we we sort of took similar ideas and we explained them as anxious all the time which is just a it's a description of how a person is it's not a diagnosis and it's not saying you're a particular kind of person who has a particular kind of situation it's just saying observably this character seems to their friends to be anxious all the time and, and that's different from from giving the character a diagnosis. And so we consciously did that. Like we avoided using the names of diagnoses for people, but still the, the personality traits you observe in other people, those do seem like the kinds of things we'd want to represent. So partly, uh, Vincent Gargillo, I, I, I didn't put this in here because it was already kind of there. It was just there in a little bit more of a subtle way. Uh, and so, yeah, we've gone through a few of these. Uh, one last one that I wanted to uh, uh, highlight was uh, La Coalition this morning. Uh, he missed the, the cutoff to, uh, to, to make suggestions here, but he started throwing some ideas around. And one idea that he threw around was called um, had three and a half dogs, suggesting that someone takes in dogs who maybe have disabilities and things like that. I felt like there was a lot of ways you could read three and a half dogs. It felt a little bit weird. But one thing that actually I, I just kind of wanted to highlight, let's take anxious all the time and replace its name briefly and we'll undo this in just a second but um if i actually type okay if i type three and a half dogs with numerals let's say, say had three and a half dogs with numerals that kind of works right you could you can kind of make that work except we've got kind of a style guide we don't actually put numerals in the names of traits because it just looks kind of cheap and so what, what, what i would have to do is type had three and a half dogs which turns red because that exceeds our character limit. And, you know, as, you know, uh, a leader of one of our communities in Mexico, uh, I think that La Coalition understands the importance of not only making character limits work, but making them work in other languages. One of the reasons why we have such a strict character limit is not because we need to make it work in English, but because we need to make it work in every language, including German, which tends to have some very, very long words. So I'm going to undo that. We're going to leave anxious all the time, untouched, not break it. But uh, that's some of the stuff we have to think about is not only what should the name of the description be, but how short can I make it? And can I fit it into our character limits? Whew. All right. So um, I'm going to move on to adding some actual traits that are suggestions from the audience. But uh, Brent, is there anything you've been waiting to hand off to me while I've been just talking a blue streak? Uh, I think I think the important one I mean, there's lots and lots of stuff rolling in, um, much of it related to flatulence. But uh, um, I think a really important one was uh, um, uh, somebody with IBS who's uh, who only takes half damage from bloater gas <laughs> because they're so accustomed to their to their own. Exactly. Yeah, that that, exactly. that that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. All right. No, but I, yeah, I, I just want to. We, I'm seeing all of your suggestions, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get to most of them because what Jeffrey is is presenting takes a lot of time for him to make sure that it all gets out there. So, yeah, honestly, sorry, I'm not, I'm not ignoring everyone. I've been a little bit too thorough, and I'm worried I'm going to run out of time now. So let's get, <laughs> let's get quickly to the actual making of the traits. So. Uh, there were a few other suggestions that we already had, uh, including like former bodybuilder. We already had that. Shaky hands. Already had that. Uh, Archim the Guardian. Daryl solves problems. Uh, pack mule. That's actually, uh, we avoided uh, naming traits after animals just because comparing a person to an animal can sometimes be a mean thing people do. And we just didn't want to represent that in our communities. Uh, and so we had another one called does heavy lifting that is actually under the surface called pack mule. Um, and hibachi cook, uh, Anton Nunez, we already, we already had. 
but uh, a few that we didn't. Uh, Daryl Solves Problems suggested the idea of uh, a trait called childlike. And he suggested that, uh, that, you know, that basically this is a character who makes fart jokes all the time. Uh, and, 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 and they, are ha they have great morale because they're having an awesome time, but everyone else finds them annoying. Uh, and I thought that, that, that's kind of, uh, that's the sort of thing that we do actually like to depict in the game. So let's, let's find, let's see, let's find morale. I think morale is, pro here we go, morale. Okay, so let's find morale attributes. Let's just copy and paste one of these. So we've got kleptomaniac here. Uh, in, in order to save ourselves a little bit of time, let's just copy and paste kleptomaniac. And then let's change everything about it. So instead of childlike, let's call it childish. And the reason I'm suggesting that is because we've got sort of a, a stylistic thing we do here where the name of a trait is how other people see the character. But then the description of the trait is how the character explains themselves. And so we should probably say, because the, the name of the trait is how other people view them, let's use the more pejorative term, childish, because this is everyone looking down on this person for being weird. But then let's still give them a description along the lines of what Daryl was suggesting, which is something like, fart jokes are even funnier the 12th time you make them. So this is the character boldly defending their position um, and saying, <laughs> saying how this works. Uh, as far as their, their um, hero bonus, let's see. So it's somebody who's like f may maybe funny and entertaining, maybe annoying. Um, you know, they've got a positive outlook. They love them, just absolutely love what they're doing. Storytelling, uh, silence policy, frequent check-ins. You know, I, I don't know if any of these is particularly appropriate here. Um, Actually, you know what? Helpful mockery, stamina, helpful mockery. So this is the this gives everybody uh, additional stamina because they're constantly being verbally abused by someone. Uh, so we'll do that. Let's call. Okay, this is an attribute. It is morale. Um, we could have it affect the character's standing. Actually, oh, that, so, yeah. Let's not make that be a thing. Not make that be a thing. We've got a hero bonus. They are annoying. Uh, they don't have to be conflict prone though. And this is an objectionable trait to have on a brand new character at the very beginning of the game. So uh, yeah, so let's say they cause, uh, okay, so this is the character buff. Okay, so what this is saying, the kleptomania trait gives everyone in the community a negative seven to morale. That's not what we want to do with this character. We want this character to be entertaining themselves. So we're gonna look at all our list of morale buffs here. We'll try to find a positive one. Um, there we go, morale bonus. Small. Let's say plus five morale just to this character entertaining themselves, and it applies to themselves only. But then let's also give them a negative, uh, which would be aside from this, which also which makes them involved in conflicts. But let's say that their standing uh, will go down. So let's look for standing. Standing rate reduce medium. So minus 33% standing rewards, which means that they don't progress in the community as quickly because uh, people think that they're weird and annoying. Uh, these nicknames don't make any sense. We can come up with some new ones, though. Um, we could just call them Kid, for instance. Uh, that might be a little bit weird. I don't know. Let's, uh, we'll think about that. We'll get rid of these nicknames. If anybody thinks of a really good idea for a nickname for a childish person, I mean, honestly, we, should just, we could just call them Fart. Uh, that would be fine, right? A little weight of five there. And then community buffs, we don't need any skills. We don't need to give this character any skills. They're fine. Uh, so yeah, so now we've got, we've got a childish trait. So thank you, Daryl Solves Problems, for suggesting that. Uh, but this one didn't do any skills. Let's actually grab one that actually might suggest some skills. So uh, Altered Beast 420 suggested we could do one called Played Hide and Seek. So let's go up to Wits, Stealth. Let's grab that Wallflower trait. Let's duplicate that. And let's make uh, a trait that makes somebody sneaky. So let's call this one. Uh, this isn't an attribute, though. This is a before story. Or maybe it's a hobby. Let's call it a hobby. Uh, so yeah, so hide, call it hide, seek, whatever. And then let's say, now played hide and seek. Almost everyone played hide and seek at some point. Let's just say that they loved hide and seek. So they're, they're different from everyone else because it just, it w hide and seek was really important to them as a character. Let's match this with a lot of the other ones. And then here, I don't know, what can we type here? Something like, um, what does Ollie, Ollie, Oxen, Free even mean? Um, <laughs> because whatever, what is that? Uh, did people 
play this game to give their cattle a fighting chance to escape. Now that's not gonna work, that's way too long. So how about I just say this? Uh, what does Ollie Ollie Oxen Free even mean? Uh, quiet time might actually be an appropriate one for this one. Uh, except, is there like in, some kind of like, I'm trying to remember, was there like intramural? Yeah, intramural sports. They organize games, and so they improve morale by organizing games. Okay, so this is not an attribute. This is a hobby, and characters can have multiple hobbies. Uh, I think this is not going to affect their standing. This affects their wits. It's badass enough. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with conflict, and I don't remember what the test one was, so I'm just going to leave it there. And then let's say, okay, so what, what character buffs should this have? So Altered Beast suggested that this should directly affect the, uh, th their stealth, like how quiet they are, uh, how far away they can be for a zombie to notice them. Those are not buffs that I have here. The only place where I've got buffs like that are way over here in the skills. So if I pop open the skills and I look at wit specialties and I go over here and we're going to look at these a little bit later. If we look over here at uh, stealth, we've actually got some, uh, some stealth buffs here. Skill, stealth, passive one, skill, stealth, passive two. These are the buffs that as you're ri rising the skill uh, in the stealth skill that make you harder and harder for zombies to detect. But we don't want to use those because those are specific to the stealth skill. They're all about the stealth skill. And so that would actually kind of interfere with the stealth skill if we started giving those buffs out to any other character who happened to have a random uh, trait. So we're not going to do that. Instead, let's get rid of character buffs entirely and just make this about granting the character the stealth skill. So uh, right here, we've got granting them the stealth skill. And let's make them even better at it than the wallflower. They've really put time and effort into getting good at, the, at stealth. So let's give them five stars in stealth. Uh, and so, yeah, so now if a character starts with the loved hide-and-seek trait, that means you can expect them to show up with the stealth skill at level five. And, uh, yeah, we are already just running out of so much time, but traits are kind of the big one. We'll spend a little bit less time on the other stuff. Um, so another suggestion that we got was uh, from Matthew Taylor. He suggested we could do something called homesteader. And what he was hoping it was, was this is somebody who has already built their apocalypse base before. They've done it just as part of their normal life. They are, they're, they're all ready for the apocalypse and they somehow missed out on living at their actual base, but they've done it before. They know how to manage sort of the logistics of building a base. And so they would give, for instance, um, an increase to all of your, uh, a decrease to all of your costs or an increase to all of your incomes. The problem is I don't actually have that buff. I don't have the ability to mess with all of your incomes, and it might also be a little bit OP. Uh, we've got a few traits out here that are so OP that players just always want them, and if we gave you a trait that powerful, I'm worried that it would just become the meta, and it would take over a little bit. So, I like the idea of that, of Homesteader as a uh, sort of a background, but uh, let's let's have it do something slightly different. So, I'm I'm actually thinking of doing something a little bit weird with this. Let me tr find the right category for it. I guess it's probably stats. Let's make a new one completely from scratch. So let's call this one Homesteader. And, oh wait, no, we need to give it the whole big, long, elaborate name. Let's call this um, Material Costs, because that's what we're going to be messing with, and call it Homesteader. And then we will, uh, and oh, oh, this is before story. This is a before story as well. This is a, so I'll, I'll do before to categorize it. Let's make this very rare because I think it is, will still be kind of, uh, kind of powerful. So let's go homesteader. And then the description, something along the lines of, I spent my life building an apocalypse base, a uh, survival base. So, of course, the outbreak hit while I was on vacation. That's too long. Uh, what if we just say building a base? There we go. I spent my life building a base, so, of course, the outbreak hit while I was on vacation. Uh, bonus, I think that high expectations might be uh, appropriate for this. Uh, let's put some tags on here. Let's say that you know this is a before story. Uh, it tells you know a story about what the person was doing before uh, they got started, um, and I mean it's got a hero bonus. We'll slap hero on there, and maybe let's let's give them badass. 
because out here, somebody who's done this before is probably pretty badass. Uh, and then what I was thinking we would do is give them a community buff, which is material, was it called material costs? Uh, I'll look up the word cost. I think I found one that might be appropriate. Yeah, so basically one of our um, difficulty buffs that we use uh, for like the green zone, it, it reduces your materials costs for building stuff. So this is me co-opting a buff from another part of the game. And I'm going to have to talk with some folks about whether this is a good idea. We might not ship this one. But the idea is uh, all of your materials costs when you're building things are just a little bit less because you've got this person in your community. Um, so that's a little bit powerful. It might be OP. I'm going to need to talk with somebody about that. But I kind of wanted to show you the power that this t system has. Like, even though there's certain things I can't do, I can't script entirely new behaviors into the game, I can co-opt things if I want to and take uh, something we built for one part of the game and put it in another. Uh, Jeffrey? Yes. If you don't call this person salt and prepper, I'm going to quit. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that's that's. I, I don't know if I can type that in a way that'll look right. Salt and prepper. <laughs> um... Prep, uh, Come Prep, on, uh, let's get the prep here. Okay, I, uh, I'm not sure about that. We'll, we'll, I'll think about that. I'll think about that one. I'll think about that one. It looks, it looks like I just quit my job. Uh, <laughs> nice knowing y'all. Um, okay, so the last one, I think we're not going to get to the taco one today. The last one I kind of wanted to, uh, to show you was uh, people have been making, like, when we raised this question, people made a lot of comments about one of the favorite traits, which is basically the meta. Uh, which is Blood Plague Survivor. So let's look at Blood Plague Survivor. Because one thing that somebody noticed, and th they called this out of my personal stream, uh, which was the only characters who can have Blood Plague Survivors are sheriffs and warlords. And that wasn't something I thought about or planned in advance, but when you look at it, absolutely. Daring. This is a tag that says, only give this trait to sheriffs and warlords. And they were like, why is that? And, and, and the way that I was thinking about it was, this is somebody who risked themselves, put themselves at risk a lot, got blood plague, and then just through, through sheer force of luck, ended up not dying from it. And they, it, the disease ran its course and they never catch it again. And it sounds pretty cool. So I was like, oh yeah, this is a very daring person who put themselves out there. But I wasn't thinking about the fact that it limits it to half the population. So, um, Let's not do that anymore. So now twice as many characters are going to be able to get Blood Plague Survivor just because I deleted that one little trait, uh, that one little tag. So there you go. That's some edits to the trait system. And that took me like 40 minutes. Uh, and I was expecting this to take like 25. So unfortunately, you get me talking about the trait system and I just talk an awful lot. So let's talk about something else now. Let's have a look at the skills. So this is the actual Unreal Editor, shrunk down to fit on this screen. Uh, but this is, so we're using an entirely different tool when we make skills uh, versus, uh, versus making traits. So here we're in the wit specialties, but I can actually go where we want to be, which is the quirk skills. So the quirk skills, these are the random little fifth skills that appear on characters. They only have one star. They don't do very much. And mostly what they do is get in the way of other skills that you want that character to have. And so we, we, we polled people, we asked them to make some suggestions questions for, uh, for skills that we could add into the game. We got a, you know, a bunch of kind of fun ones. Uh, some of them are ones that we, that we probably couldn't do. Zed von Kotmal suggested um, an introversion uh, skill that would, uh, that would add one to your outpost limit, which had two problems. Number one, we only have space to add one more outpost to your outpost limit, and I want to save it. There's got to be a special thing that we need to do that will, add, that will take advantage of that, uh, that last plus one outpost. So, I don't want to do it for this stream. Uh, another thing was introversion is a trait. Introversion is not a skill. Uh, and stylistically, whenever we give a character a skill, we want that skill to be something that indicates I am trained in something, I have an expertise in something, not I've just got uh, uh, this aspect to my personality. That's an important distinction to make. I think it really makes the, the, the system make sense. But it's something that, I mean, you are not the only one, Zed, uh, to, to, to make a suggestion like that. We often get suggestions all over the place, within and without the team, for skills that are not really skills. 
Um, uh, Death Druid made a suggestion of throw of can throw melee weapons, which again that would be adding an entire uh, mechanic to the game. We talked in the traits section about how that's not something that I can easily do, uh, but that I mean you did kind of nail the way that I would love for skills as a general rule to work um, in a game like this, which is it adds some kind of verb to the character, something they can do that other people can't do. And I think that we you know the skill system in State of K two does not do that as much as I'd like it to, but that's sort of the theory. That's what we'd like to do with it. So. We'll see how that goes. Um, and yeah, there's a, f there's a lot of other good suggestions. Sleight of hand, linguistics. I don't have time to implement a lot of these. Uh, and, and some of them, you know, uh, some of them already existed. Uh, Castle suggested uh, hairdressing, which we actually already have. Uh, we've got hairdressing right here. Uh, it basically, uh, the main thing that it does is it gives characters, where was it? It gives them a little bit of influence because it basically um, it influence income because all everyone just looks so fancy. Uh, they 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 get they have better reputations across the uh, across the frontier, and also it gives them knowledge of chemistry because you know you got to work with the bleaches and the everything uh, to be a hairdresser. Similarly, uh, Daniel Felt suggested smuggling, uh, but the the advantages he suggested for smuggling were all the same advantages you get from driving. And so I figured, ah, we've already got driving. We probably don't need to add smuggling. Uh, though I could see us adding a trait which is was a smuggler that gives people the driving skill so that's something that we could do at some point and would do if i wasn't running out of time uh so instead let's grab this one from uh matt's nerd coven one uh who he suggested that we should have a uh, a skill called history uh, which is, you know, just the, the study of history, the knowledge of history. And he was suggesting uh, that maybe that would give you local history and so we can make our landmark outposts more powerful. But again, that's a whole mechanic that I don't have access to, so I can't do the thing that you suggested. Um, but one thing that we could probably do is just give people an experience advantage. The idea, you know, if you know history, then you're less likely to repeat it. You make better decisions. You learn better if you have uh, a, 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 an historian on, ta uh, on, on, on staff, basically. So let's do that. So let me try to find what would be a good one to do. Let's, let's duplicate uh, literature. So I'm going to copy and paste literature. And it arrives here. Let's rename it history. And it's got to check it out of source control. It's got to do a bunch of stuff, blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. Now let's pop open its definition. So this still looks like literature on the inside. So we'll call it history. We'll make its display name history. And we'll say something like, uh, I, I hadn't actually come up with a, uh, I hadn't come up with a description for this one. So like, yeah, the study, yeah, let's call this the study of the past and how not to repeat it uh that's what we'll call that and it's got a generic icon because i don't think we've got a history appropriate icon and now we've got to have give it its benefit the thing that it does so it doesn't give us a morale bonus because knowing about history sometimes makes you sadder um but oh but skill all rate increase medium that's actually perfect i didn't actually realize that i was doing this i was duplicating literature literature already does the thing i was hoping history would do which is increase uh increase the rate at which you gain skills but yeah this is oh yeah it's only applied to the so okay this is interesting this is one of the limitations of the skill of the uh trait system of the skill system so if you look at the traits when i give somebody a character buff i can decide whether to give it to themselves only or to the entire community but with a skill, I'm not sure I can do that. Um, or let me pop open the actual, there we go. But let's see here. But I think maybe this, oh, that's right. So for most of the development of State of Decay 2, I couldn't do that. But I'm pretty sure that this new category here that they added very, very late does actually let me do that. So uh, base enclave wide buff. So I'm gonna grab this buff here that was normally a base buff. For literature, it only affects you, but we could have history affect everyone and that's how we would do that except the medium skill increase that's probably kind of powerful let's uh let's try to find another here let's go let's let's look it up skill all rate increase let's get, let's give the most a minor buff rather than a major one like the plus 25 percent maybe or even tiny wait why is tiny okay tinier yeah there we go let's, let's go skill all rate increase tinier i'm gonna copy this copy this text 
and then I'm going to undo because we don't want to actually change what Blood Plague Survivor does. That would be a disaster. Um, and then we'll paste it in here. Boink. And here is one of the weaknesses, one of the reasons why I like using the un Undead Data Editor instead of un the Unreal 4 Editor. There is no content validation here. You'll notice that when I would enter things into UDE, you would get this drop down of all of the actual buffs, the real buffs that actually exist, and I would select one, and it would definitely be a real buff. I don't have that protection when I'm working in uh, the Unreal Editor. I just paste this in, and I hope I put it in the right slot, and I hope that it's all spelled correctly, because if it's not, this skill will do nothing. Um, and I don't have any way to find out until we actually go into the game and test it, which is another reason why I need to make sure that I account for all of this to QA before we, <laughs> before we try to po post it you know, live uh, someplace. By the way, none of this is going into Update 34, because Update 34 needs... Yeah, it needs to not be corrupted by my random interference. So um, anyway, so yeah, so that's what history now does. I'm just going to save this. Takes a little bit longer to save, but there you go. Uh, there is now a skill in the game called history, but no one is ever going to get it because the only way you get skills is through traits. Traits is what gives you skills. So let's... Um, Let's find, I don't know, is there, is there a trade out there that has something to do with history? Um, we've got Rifle Collector. I mean, Rifle Collector might have something to do with history, right? We're already adding the shooting skill to this person. We could give them the history skill. Uh, and there's also, I think there was another one I saw. It was like Professor. Professor is one that, uh, actually, let's see here. Uh, yeah, College Professor. This is somebody who might have the, the, the history skill, except, so here's another problem. People uh, sometimes don't like quirk skills. <laughs> and so if I took an existing skill, uh, an existing trait, and attached a quirk skill to it, a, a very common trait, I think people might actually complain um, because they're like, oh, great, another character with a quirk skill. So I'm going to have to think about this uh, and decide, you know, maybe, maybe what I should actually do is duplicate college professor. So I'm going to copy and paste college professor. And let's specifically make this a history professor. So we're not going to mess with any of your existing college professors. And let's make this one significantly less common. And honestly, I don't even need to, dis uh, like, yeah, I, I don't even need to change this. They're even talking about being a history professor. Uh, and then the only thing I'm going to change is in addition to just, you know, doing the same witch specialties that uh, that they already were doing, I'm just going to add, actually, it's not even this one. Oh, it is this one. But yeah, I'm going to add the history skill, which has already added. You notice I just saved it. I just barely made the history skill. It is already added uh, to, the, uh, to, to the validation list here, which is great. Somebody designed some really good tools on our team. And then we're going to, we're going to add one star to the history skill. Let's type that in again. Add one star to the history skill. And we're going to limit the history skill. Nope. Limit the history skill to one star. And this is how we actually did This is the hackiest thing ever. All of your one star skills, you would think that they're a special class of skill that only has one star. No, every time we implement one of them in a trait, we manually limit it to one star because it was a late game decision. We just used the tools that we had. So anyway, so now we've got this one trait, a very rare trait that could give someone the history skill that will then increase everyone's XP rate. So uh, hopefully that doesn't sound valuable enough to you that you're all going to be like, you know, spamming the random button forever to try to get a history professor because it's not going to happen very often. There are 1300 plus of these traits, but there you go. I've got seven minutes left, and there's two whole categories of things, but they're kind of short. Um, and you know what? Why don't I skip the nicknames? Because I do nicknames all the time. On my personal stream, if you follow me, it, uh, my channel is called Durangatang. There's going to be a, li uh, a link in the doobly-doo. Um, you know, uh, I, I constantly am adding names to the game based on people's recommendations because it's a channel point reward on my, uh, on my personal stream. And so I talk about that all the time over there. Let's skip that one for now and see if we can spend some time on Enclave names. Please add Taco Ninja. <laughs> As a nickname? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, you know what? Just real fast, just for you, Brant. Let's, let's, find, let's find the name Brant. 
So we've got Brant uh, as a oh we got Brant as a nickname for Brandon. Oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, okay, so that is ridiculous. Okay, no, we need to add your name is not in the game, dude. I don't know how we failed that, but uh, so let's go to Anglo American Rare. Let's go. Let's see here, are you middle aged or old, Brant? Uh, let's let's go with old, and yep. add uh, let's add the name Brant as a given name, and uh, the nickname Taco Ninja with a weight of 15. So that means that basically anytime somebody is named Brant, there's a, they have a really good chance of just going by the name Brant, but they've got a smaller chance of going by the name Taco Ninja. And uh, I think that probably works. So there we go. We just added a name and a nickname to the game. Uh, there's a few others, and maybe we'll come back to this if we end up with 30 seconds at the very end. But uh, let's talk about enclave names so whenever we create an enclave in the game we create them from what we call uh, a schema which is sort of a list of rules for how that enclave comes together how many people it can have in it if there's any restrictions on the skills those people need to have for instance if they all need to have military backgrounds or they all need to be alcoholics so they all need to be cannibals um and you know things like that and one of the things that you select when you're choosing um uh, an enclave schema's sort of data is the name list that it draws from and so different you know enclaves you'll notice that the booze hounds uh enclave consistently has names having to do with alcohol the military uh the military enclave consistently has names that are associated with the military the medics consistently have medical names and so i figured that maybe we could just pop open uh the weird enclave names which is just you know these are the names we only use for the strangest characters you encounter uh, out in the world. Uh, we don't use these names very often, and some of them are just absolutely horrifying. But because they're so rare, nah, nobody cares. Uh, so we put some of our worst ideas on this list. And I actually, I actually did a video on my own channel where I just read all of them out um, and had fun with that. But let's, let's throw a couple names on here. So we had a... Uh, so, Stret so Stretton Matthew suggested... Let's, let's just... Let's uh, add a couple of empty ones here on the end. So I'm just going to add Enclave. Nope. Okay, each time I do this, it's going to scroll down. I'm not going to be happy about that. Let's make five Enclave names. <laughs> Is that Was that number four or was that number five? I can't count. Whatever, now we've got six Enclave names. Okay, so we got one suggestion uh, from Stretton Matthew, which was the hot dogs. And that's just fine. There's nothing wrong with being called the hot dogs. So I figured we'd throw that out there. Not very rare. All of these guys have let have have names of weights that are less than a hundred because they're just all they're all silly. Um, uh, Daniel Felt suggested uh, the loots of us. So I guess it's people who just have a lot of loot for you. I don't know. That one's really weird. So I might make that like a five. Uh, Shrimpology suggested we could have a group called the Theater Kids. So yeah, I'll go with that. I'm spelling it the American way. Uh, but yeah, the theater kids, that, that one that one could be kind of common. That was like, you know, uh, a 10 or maybe maybe a 30. You imagine the theater kids would stick together. Now, we probably could make a special enclave schema that is just theater kids, people who have acting or something in their backgrounds. But I don't think we'd have to make a whole mission about that. We're not doing all of that on this stream. No way. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy is the fact that all of these are designed so that they can have the word the at the beginning of them. Because in all of the sentences that uh, enclave names appear in, they all have the before the enclave name. So, so you've got the three caballeros, the specimens, the trustworthy mages. Most of these have the word the. But I really like to kind of mess with that a little bit and not just have it be the some plural noun, which is most of them. And so there's a couple uh, that that you know, that, that made suggestions like that. Alan Shedder made the suggestion of the family Robinson, which we could totally do. Um, it's, it's out of copyright, right? So we can use that, that reference. Headlock1237 suggested the Hero Society. Why not? Maybe some people call themselves that. Um, Jeffrey? Yes. What are you laughing at? I have at? to jump in here because Ginger Puka, who is a redhead, said... The soulless and make them all redheads. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean, we can definitely make the soulless. We're not going to be able to make that rep. We can't control it, people's hair color. That is not a parameter that I've been I given. But no, that's that's great. Um, and then we had another couple of suggestions that I... Uh, Matthew Taylor suggested the Bush people. And part of me is like, I don't know what that's a reference to, but it feels like 
uh, there's probably a uh, I mean there's so many things that Bush people can mean it can mean people who just love the band Bush from the 90s it can be people people who love the president's Bush from different decades uh, it could be people who are from a place called the Bush and because it's so undefined I was a little bit nervous about throwing that into the game just because I don't know what people what people could take it as um, and then there was a few suggestions that actually were in Spanish uh, which you know, I'm just very cautious about that. I know we've had, uh, uh, I had uh, one person, one viewer on my personal channel uh, who had a name in Spanish where the moment that one of my mods, La Coalición, saw it, he uh, speaks Spanish natively. Um, he saw it, he was like, never say this man's name out loud because it's horribly offensive in Spanish. And so because I don't speak Spanish, I was not gonna take any of the Spanish language suggestions for fear that it means something in some kind of slang in some Spanish speaking country that I don't get and I'm gonna put something horrific into the game. So you have to be very careful about this stuff and vet it by people because um, it's very easy to just accidentally stumble into something in a well-meaning way that, uh, that comes across horribly. Oh, this is a good one. The former IT people for, and and they say, thank God the internet's gone. <laughs> That's true. I, so unfortunately, I can't tie uh, uh, explanations to these the way that I can with, with traits. Traits always come with an explanation. But uh, enclaves, they have descriptions, but the descriptions are determined by missions and have nothing to do with their names. It's all very freewheeling and haphazard. And so uh, that would be great. I would love to be able to do that. Similarly, you know, if I could say that the Solus, we were all originally redheads, something like that, maybe something like that could come across, but we just don't have that in, in the data. Anyway, uh, it is 4 p.m. We have run out of time, and so we should probably wrap this up. But thank you to everyone who made suggestions. I only got to a fraction of them, uh, either by mentioning them and saying we weren't going to do them or actually putting them into the game. Uh, but, you know, maybe we should do this again sometime. I think I had a lot of fun, uh, and maybe next time I can spend more time adding traits and less time explaining traits, uh, which you know, I think I spent at least 30 minutes just explaining how the tools worked. But uh, I just love this stuff. I mean, this is one of my favorite things I've ever done in my entire career is work on this character generation system and all of its weird little pieces. Uh, and, you know, the tools that the programmers uh, gave me between, you know, Jurgen and Matthew and, and other folks who worked on this, like, this is, I've been having the time of my life with these tools. So uh, I'm glad that you all were able to sort of come along with me to sort of see how this stuff works, to see the, the, my favorite part of my job. And uh, with that, we should probably wrap this up. Brant, thank you so much for sort of manning the chat and uh, bringing in some of the funnier comments that folks made. Uh, any last words to the audience before we go? No, but uh, other than uh, I love I love when we do streams like this because you get to explain your favorite part of the game and you always perk up when you talk about names and traits and stuff. It's always fun to watch. Well, yeah, and it's thanks. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Yeah, so I actually got pretty much zero sleep last night because I'm an insomniac, but luckily this topic is so energizing, it woke me right up. This is better than any kind of caffeine. So uh, thank you all for your suggestions, and, and thank you, Brant, for, uh, for, for the work that you did on this stream. With that... Let's get out of here. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, next month, we're going to bring back the Wushu team. We're going to meet some more members of that team, and we're going to find out what's going on with Update 34. So please join us then, and we'll see you later. Yep.